Hello guys, good evening. So we're here today, uh, very excited to introduce a great team. They're from Greece and they're actually the, the most important people in Greece on cryptocurrency right now. And they have a great project which they're going to talk to us about. And I'd like to introduce Xenophone, which I met through my program at university. Uh, we together studying in the Master in Digital Currency at the University of Nicosia. And he's actually a famous guy in the crypto industry and in Greece, but also worldwide, there's a lot of contacts and uh, he's been uh, working uh, on amazing projects. And I'm going to let him introduce himself and then uh, introduce his team that is here with us. And then you're going to dig deeper into all the crypto topics that we have for today. Absolutely, Tony. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Xenophon Contour is here. We are starting a project called Athens DAO, which is associated with a community that is invite only and curated highly. Uh, with me, I have two of my colleagues and active advisors in George and another gentleman who's asked to remain anonymous for now. We, in short, are a curated community with both traditional lab attached to the community and attached to the DAO called Athens DAO and Athens Labs, respectively. What we aim to achieve is twofold, right? First of all, we want to make sure that we can provide the service to our community, which is up with yield farming, and provide our community with access to strategies that they would normally not be able to execute themselves, all under one transaction, under one gas fee. And the second would be to highlight much of the community that exists in Greece, but is not yet known or uh, sufficiently activated globally to achieve what the talents that we have here can achieve. And thank you so much for the kind words. We are quite established in the Greek ecosystem, but we're not the best. And there are so many amazing talent out there that we can help bring up, which is a big part of why Athens Lab exists and why the community has, was started in the first place. With that, George and my other advisor, which is the way that I'm going to call you henceforth, would you like to briefly say a few words and a quick hello? Yeah, sure. So, George, also, uh, yeah, as Jennifer uh, mentioned, I've been working together in this project. My main focus is on uh, crypto investments and exploring the latest uh, strategies for yield farming and different other kind of uh, strategies in, that have come up uh, lately in the crypto world. And happy to be here as well. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm the other guy. <laughs> My main focus is uh, in policy, decentralized finance and decentralized network governance. I'm also working with uh, Xenophon, as he mentioned, and we are excited to explore this very transformative field that uh, lies ahead of us. And of course, excited to have this discussion with you. Thank you, guys. I mean, I want to tell my community and my team that I was really impressed with you guys because, I mean, the amount of network you guys have. I mean, uh, basically, Xenophon and, and also you guys have so much you know so much people in the industry you know i think from vitali to charles in cardana i mean i saw documents and so some other decentralized uh, forum and uh, i think there were events where you guys basically know all the personality in the crypto industry so of course you you know and understand things that we as a normal human be don't are not able to know for a while so i mean to have an insight from you that would be amazing and i don't know maybe i can start with a small simple question then some of the questions will be also done by my colleague and friend, uh, Mehdi. But, you know, I think that one of the simple questions that I can ask is uh, about maybe about Ether, about, I mean, we as uh, equity investors, you know, we always try to understand that in companies, for example, what is the, the company that makes money or gain most value is a company that have a moot. A moot is like a competitive advantage versus other type of uh, companies for some reason, maybe because the product is so better, maybe because they have a special advantage that other company or special brain other company cannot actually beat. So I think somehow can work similarly in the crypto world, like you have a currency or an ecosystem, let's call it an ecosystem more than a currency that is much better doing things versus others that is going to grow and uh, potentially is going to gain market share versus others. Obviously, the first thing I think is about Ether, about the difference between Ether and Bitcoin. I will ask if you think that Ether will ever eventually gain more popularity and eventually market share than, than Bitcoin. And uh, how do you see the Ether upgrade going through and what's going to happen at the end of, of the upgrade? And then we can move from there. Thank you, Tony. I know all of us are 
jump would be happy to jump and answer the, this question. So I can give you a pretty brief overview. I think everyone here understands the value of Bitcoin, respects it as the king currently and as the leader in what became cryptocurrencies and blockchain. We were not going to be here if it wasn't for Bitcoin. And there are multiple ways that Bitcoin will survive and thrive in the future. But we are big fans and proponents of Ethereum. Very big. Specifically, we believe that if Ethereum succeeds, and it, it looks quite likely that it's going to be one of the main winners, but we really can't predict the future. Then we believe that, it, yes, I personally believe that the market capitalization of Ethereum will increase and will perhaps outpace Bitcoin and, and surpass it. I believe that because if it becomes the basis of finance, as we've been saying as a joke, but also as a target, it will probably hold more transactional value and through L2s and L1s, and it will probably become the basis of much of what's going to come for the future of finance and decentralized finance. That's my quick response. So uh, if anybody else would like to jump in here. Yeah, a quick comment from my side. You mentioned the mode, right? So that's uh, that's quite an interesting way to approach that. And we can see that both ecosystems have a mode, right? So Bitcoin, of course, was the first mover in the in the space. And the biggest mode it has at the moment is, I would say, the security of the network and the decentralization, right? There is no other network which is more decentralized and more secure than Bitcoin, right? On the other side, Ethereum has also its own mode. Right, so, so the big, in comparison to Bitcoin and also to other networks, is the smart contracts, right? So you can do a lot more complex things. You can build on top of Ethereum a lot more complex things that you can do on Bitcoin on the layer one, at least, right? And, and in terms of the market capitalization, or you mentioned market share, I think, yeah, so, I mean, Ethereum, I mean, the big difference is that the Bitcoin is a deflationary asset, like we just have 21 million Bitcoins, you can never have more. Ethereum is not like that, right? But you have to keep your eyes on the new improvement proposal that is coming in July, the 1559, which is introducing really interesting aspects into Ethereum, making it essentially a deflationary asset. They're not capping the supply, but they're inducing introducing a mechanism, a burning mechanism, let's say, that will reduce the Ethereum circulation. Right? So that will help a lot to increase its, its, its value as well. Right? I would like to add that Bitcoin has some very good reasons for being at the top of the, of the cryptocurrency market cap. Its value proposition as a digital gold still stands as a very valid, albeit somewhat less exciting when compared to that of the Ethereum. But I do think that with CBDCs and negative interest rates coming and helicopter money and other measures in monetary policy that might affect uh, depositors, the value proposition of Bitcoin as a digital gold will still remain compelling in the future. Now, Ethereum, on the other hand, has a lot of things going for itself. One of the biggest questions, if you're making any kind of platform that can run smart contracts, one of the first things that people are going to ask is if it is EVM compatible and if you have developed bridges to interoperate with the theme. So both ecosystems are great. I'm not sure value, <laughs> it is subjective. It really depends on what the market wants. And I think that both are valid and Ethereum is certainly an exciting project uh, and uh, we haven't seen the end of it in terms of applications, not even close. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. I mean, uh, also the Bitcoin being considered like as a digital gold, like a commodity and, you know, maybe playing in the macro as an edge uh, with inflation and maybe looking at Ether in uh, more like a, it would be a tech stock, you know, that could be appreciating during the time, you know, with time and grow, you know, its ecosystem. Do you think uh, that other uh, competitors coming into the space like Polkadot, like Solana, Luna, would they be able to have uh, eventually also uh, Cardano, would they eventually to uh, challenge Ether? Would they be an Ether, I wouldn't say killer, but at least uh, competitors, would they gain value with time? Are they more undiscovered? So would they have more potential versus Ether? Or when Ether would... Uh, would prove that is uh, when the, the Ether 2 would be upgrade would be 
done, then it would probably prove that there's no need of others. What's your view on those? And just to add on that, uh, do you think, are we heading towards the future where the market will be fragmented with different ecosystem and there will be like a lot of perfect competition with very easy barriers of entry and we'll perhaps see many ecosystem coexisting together? Yeah, sure. So exactly. That's uh, the, the, your last comment. Exactly my point, right? So I believe and I think, yeah, our group, we have discussed these topics as well. That's the correct word, right? The coexistence and interoperability, right? So there is no killer of anyone. So whoever talks about killers, I think it, they cannot see the future very clearly, right? So you will see that we will have different kind of chains, different kind of ecosystems with their own target, with their own community target and user target, like there will be, Ethereum will be most probably very expensive, will be for the bigger accounts, you will have the L2s or Binance chain or Solana, which is cheaper for even smaller players. You can have Flow, for example, which is a specialty in NFTs and so forth, right? So that's how it's going to work. And everything will come together through bridges. You see like projects, for example, like Cosmos or Tor chain or multi-chain or any swap just bridging all these things together, right? You go from Ethereum to Binance Chain to Phantom to Luna and so forth, right? So that's where we're going. Yeah, I'm not a proponent of the Ethereum killer dogma. I do not believe that there will be such thing. I do not believe that open blockchains will be a zero-sum game. Different networks have different trade-offs, and this is something that we knew from the beginning with the blockchain trilemma and different design options will satisfy the, the needs of different people. If you don't care about decentralization so much, then you can, then you can do whatever you want to do on a chain that does not care about decentralization so much. I do believe that the, the, in its current state, Ethereum serves the role of this uh, ultimate finality layer with more flexible and uh, speedy chains uh, taking up some of the more, you know, flexible applications such as decentralized finance. We've seen the shift in, in Binance Smart Chain. We've seen the shift in Phantom and in many other chains. One of the first thing, things that those newcomers in the space develop are interoperable bridges. And this really pay, shows the way to the future that it will not be a zero-sum game, but rather a network of communicating networks, if that makes sense. Now, that's for Ethereum 1. Ethereum 2 is a whole nother beast and nobody can say for sure what the effects of this scaling process will be. And of course, scaling is always will always be the question. The more we can scale a network, the more applications we will put on top of it and the more it will need to be scaled. So I do think that the only way that we can you know, make this open decentralized space relevant is to make it interoperable. And I'm going to add a few things on here. I do believe that in the future we will see the growth of permissioned ledgers. I do think that the biggest competitor to Ethereum, which never came to fruition, at least not yet, was Libra. I think there are benefits to some permission changed. There are trade-offs, as one of my colleagues said, and really that matters. If you were to build on Libra now, DM, you'd have access to over a billion and a half people that will be able to make money on there. You won't be able to get that type of scaling in the permissionless ledger, at least not yet from our minds. That will probably change in the future. I also think that programmable CBDCs might emerge in the decades to come. And that will also be a fundamental shift in the way that we do interact with each other and we do business with each other. However, the cutting edge of innovation is taking place in Ethereum. The growth of the community, the growth of the developers is outstanding. Everyone is trying to get into this Ethereum killer, which reminds me of the same mindset of what the real Bitcoin was in 2017. People were hoping to get into one of these competitors that they would then get market share and would make them rich. I think the reason people are so excited with uh, projects like Cardano, which haven't really produced something as of yet, is because they hope that if they buy in early, they will make millions, the same as some of the early pioneers in the space. But that simply, I don't think that's going to happen. Now, 
that's just an example for Ada and Cardano. I don't believe Cardano or Ada are specifically about projects and they have tremendous talent. Much of it is actually based in Athens and are Greek. So we would love to see them succeed and we would be more than happy to build with them when there is something for us to build on. And to name a couple of other projects which I believe have value at the moment, Rootstock, which is a sidechain on Bitcoin that allows for smart contract deployment. You have Binance Smart Chain, which has a competitive advantage because the liquidity there exists from the centralized exchange and you know you can do many things there. Solana is growing fast. Thor, Thor Chain seems to be a tremendous project for the future. Terra, Terra Luna, which we've discussed privately between Tony and I and many other people in the call, we believe it's a superstar. Uh, Matic Polygon is another project which we are fans of. And uh, Phantom, Avalanche, to name a few. There's also multiple side chains like Secret and XDAI, where we are probably going to deploy our DAO. All of these projects, however, have one thing in common. They are EVM compatible, and that won't change. If you, uh, we do equity research and there is a lot of things that are similar in equity to uh, crypto. One other thing is that uh, what happened in, in uh, equity that when some company are really big, like think about Apple or Amazon, you know, some younger people or people that want to make a lot of money uh, fast, they don't really like to buy those because they understand that they know that uh, the growth, the exponential growth uh, is limited. You know, I mean, Amazon cannot double its market cap in two months that easily because obviously it's already uh, huge. So uh, the same thing happened in crypto. Probably some people are, uh, think that they can buy a smaller, let's call it, you know, ecosystem with a smaller market cap so that they can grow faster. In some period, they can probably outperform Bitcoin or in this case, Ether. Do you think that uh, if you want to name only one, uh, I know you named a few of them, but which one is the one that you, beside Ether, that you, for you is the most, I mean, if you, if you cannot put your money in, into Ether or in Bitcoin, and you can only choose one to put your money, which one would that be and why? Are we specifically talking about smart chains? Smart contract uh, change, or I was talking about crypto in, in general. I would say just choose the one that the project you like more, even if it's not, you know, crypto in particular. If, if you think there's one project in particular that you think is going to have that kind of growth, uh, yes, I would prefer to be named that one. So before I answer, I just want to prep this answer. Right now, the market is hot and it's been hot for months. If you're trying to double your money now, you might be able to make that from multiple altcoins. However, if you double your money in two months, you're going to lose it in five months completely. I mean, I believe the crash is going to come like it did in 2017, like it did in 2013. I think we're going to bunch back from that for sure. And three, four years back again, we'll be making 10 times the amount of money that we are at the moment. Because, I mean, okay, I might be exaggerating, but that's how the market looks to be moving. So with that... I would be aware to anyone who's listening to this and tell them, hey, you, your timing needs to be as your ability to catch a project that you believe is valuable. So if I were to suggest a project at the moment, which is neither smart chain or Ethereum competitor, but is a project that I like and I always will like, I'm going to make give a very safe bet and I'm going to say MKR. MKR is extremely expensive at the moment. I got into MKR when it was sub 400 euros, dollars, excuse me. Now it's like, what, five and a half thousand? So I am a big fan of stable coins. It was part of my research when I was in the university. I like coins like Maker. There's a few others coming out that I believe have tremendous value. I've got burned. I know other people in the call have got burned with some of the algorithmic stable coins that we were hoping can be realized. But yeah, I'm always a fan of Maker. I'm going to keep talking about Maker. I think there's a number of other projects we will talk about later that we have gathered for you that we can discuss and, and you know propose for more research for your audience. But yeah, big fan of Maker, big fan of Ethereum, big fan of the DeFi blue chips, as we call them. I mean, these are good projects with revenues, with user bases, with communities, with uh, future DAOs. This is the future. You're still very early. It's like buying Amazon in '99. Yeah, we all love DeFi because we understand the concept of uh, you know the compounding revenue and the, the revenue they produce. Who are, uh, you know when the under management asset under management grow. So that's interesting. Whatever I can ask also your team if your team what's your the view or your team on these particular questions about uh, 
you know, which they will, uh, on which where they will bet the most money if they could not bet on Ether and on Bitcoin. And also, uh, you know, what would be, I mean, there's another thing that we probably all want to know is how do you actually play the cycle? I mean, uh, because you've been saying now, you know, hey, I mean, it's not going to always go up all the time. I mean, you're going to have a time where it's going to go down, you know, there's going to be a period in which how an uh, investor in our community or, you know, people listening to us, they just want to, they saw now, they probably missed the first cycle. Now they missed the second cycle. How are they going to know when it's time to buy, when it's time to actually stay away from it? Because in equity, for example, we know how to value them. We know exactly how to value a company. You know, technically, scientifically, we know, you know, we know what the growth is implied. We know what is the value of the asset. And we can actually take a decision based on that, not really on the technical, on that aspect. How do you do that in crypto? I just wanted to comment something on how to value cryptocurrency projects especially under the scope of traditional investment. So if something does not has, uh, have cash flows, then we cannot value it. The truth of the matter is that we, with DeFi, we do see yield generating assets, right? So to some very rudimentary extent, some techniques of traditional markets can be applied. Now, the time frames are, are still very short, and I mean, but I do expect in the near future more traditional tools. We will be able to apply traditional tools to value, especially assets that are native in the DeFi space. So that is my, my opinion, the interfacing between traditional valuation methods and you know, what's happening in cryptocurrencies at the moment. So go ahead, Xenophil, I'm sorry for that. I don't want to go first, actually. Let me wait. I would like to give the floor to George because he unmuted as well. And then I'm going to talk about how to manage cycles. But George, if you'd like to discuss about the project of your preference, please feel free to go. Sure. Um, Yeah. Also, one more comment for me. What you mentioned, uh, Tony, about valuing, right? I mean, you can really do value the, the crypto assets. You can do valuations. We always do valuations, right? Uh, I mean, myself, for example, I never just buy a project just because its price is good and they have a nice roadmap or they make nice podcasts, right? I mean, or blog posts, definitely not, right? So you, there are tools that you can go that way and, and do that. You have to look at the tokenomics, right? So it's something that someone who is not really, let's say, yeah, hasn't gone deeper in the blockchain technology in general does not understand tokenomics. But you really need to understand tokenomics because tokens are like, the shares of a company, right? And they're just a lot more dynamic and configurable, right? The shares of a company, there are a handful of things you can do with them, right? You can issue more, you can sell them, or you can vote with them. But with tokens, you can do a lot more things. So you guys have to go deep into the tokenomics, see really how if the token, for example, is deflationary deflationary or the, the strategies they've used, increasing in value, decreasing in value, right? And then our colleague also mentioned there are tools like, for example, Uniswap. I mean, I guess you know Uniswap or SushiSwap, right? I mean, this is a company at the moment, right? It works like a company. And if I'm not mistaken, since a couple of months, their monthly revenue is over $1 billion. So they generate fees, right, over a billion. So you can basically approach it as a company and evaluate it with similar strategies, you can start getting other exchanges next to each other. You can take, for example, Coinbase as an example, which is now public, and measure their the revenues and so forth, right? So there are definitely techniques there, and you should go deeper uh, than just looking at the price. So to your first question, yeah, I mean, I would like to choose more than one, but if I have to choose just one would be Luna, Terra. Uh, so the Terra ecosystem, not necessarily the Luna token, right? I would look at the Terra ecosystem. The reason is that they have captured tremendous value. Their tokenomics are amazingly good. So they have a stable coin, which is supported by the inherent token of the protocol, which is called Luna. So uh, the more adoption the ecosystem is getting, so the more stable coins is printed, the more deflationary the token becomes. So it's kind of rewarding the holders, right? So you need to look at these kind of things. I'm not saying at the moment that it's it's a good or bad price to buy Luna, but yeah, the, the price is always relative, right? So personally, I've bought Luna when it was 50 cents, and I bought also Luna when it was 12 cents, right? 
You just have to look at your assumptions that you make and you have to really look at the roadmap of a company or of a project and, and the narrative that they're following, right? And you might need to dump good projects on the way, right? So for me, it's not like, okay, uh, the end is coming, let's liquidate everything. But we really need to enforce some risk management on the portfolio and we can discuss on the strategies later. I mean, yield farming, for example, is one of these strategies that you guys can use to mitigate in, in, in a more, let's say, choppy market situation that we're just not going up or falling down, right? Thank you. Great. Now, just to address something, you mentioned about the cycles, which we didn't touch upon. And you also mentioned about actually highlighting one project. Let me tell you what I really believe. Uh, and I'm going to also mention advice that I believe your community should listen to uh, coming forward. First of all, my favorite project at the moment is my project, the one that we're building with the team that we have on the call. Okay, we have a community, we have the talent, we are building across multiple layers and we're building a co-plan structure next to it. We can talk a bit more about why Athens Labs and Athens DAO can grow in the future and will grow since it is in our hands to do so. But before I go about selling my own project, let me address the cycle question. As we saw between 2017 and 2020, we have one good year where everything is going crazy high. And then we have around two and a half, three years where the market suffers. Uh, it's numbers down. You see multiple chains become ghost chains. You see multiple companies and firms and labs stop working. That will probably change this cycle because the industry is much more mature now. And the value is, looks like it's been already discovered. And the respect for this industry and, and as an asset class is growing. But we do expect, I personally expect that there will be a fall of 70%, perhaps even more, from the all-time high of the Bitcoin price. And when Bitcoin falls, everything else falls faster. Wow. So I expect that will take place sometime in 2022. I don't know when the cycle will end. I can't predict the future, but I would say that it's going to be either within the summer or in Q4 of this year. And I say that because last time around, the reason, one of the main reasons why the crypto market fell is because of the introduction of MIFID 2. Now, MIFID was one of these regulations, directives actually, that came out of Europe that created more pressure to be, to provide AML, KYC services and, and to show that you have clear risk management of who you let buy and sell projects. Now, we expect and actually we know that there is multiple other regulations and initiatives taking place. FATA's recommendations for VASP, for example, shifts the liability uh, from no one to anyone in charge or participating in the community of a project on DeFi. Uh, it's not final yet. The recommendations haven't happened yet, but they are happening in June. And we, I do, I do believe that's going to signal a bit of a, you know, near. We will probably signal the last part of this uh, cycle, as I think it is. And then we know that uh, the market and crypto asset uh, regulation is coming. It's already in the European Parliament. It's already been drafted. Now it's being reviewed from MEPs, members of the European Parliament. We know that there will be regulations that will significantly affect the market for the first time. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because the hype in the cycle might diminish. The highs might not be as high. The lows, however, won't be as low either. And there will be pressure and they will become much, much harder for projects that, you know, may have raised a couple of billion dollars in 2017 and then disappeared without doing anything like that type of projects are not going to be seen. I mean, the cowboy days are almost over. That doesn't mean that we're not going to the moon. I mean, we will be moving forward. The industry will be growing. The value is real. The innovation is real. The talent is real. There is no industry with as many geniuses, in quotations, as crypto. And that's a quote from Mel Gelderman, which is the founder of Monolith a very interesting project combining traditional finance with DeFi. So that's true. The reason the Bill Gage of our age is Vitalik is because crypto is the same technology or the same class of technology as the personal computer. 
and then the internet companies that came about afterwards. So yeah, beware, wait for the main cycle, sell when uh, you see the price of Bitcoin and other crypto doesn't reach the previous all time high, sell for stable coins because you might be wrong and you might want to buy again and that's going to become easier and start enjoying some of your profits because if you are in the industry, you've made tremendous profits already. Yeah, someone has made the amazing project, actually. I mean, amazing profits. I mean, I could not believe. Um, I mean, when I speak to some people and we were complaining about how expensive could be university, and then you see that, you know, I mean, $100 invested in any good project in the past few months would have made probably 10 times, 15 times the money. So it was good to be close to the field and understand everything. About the valuations, just coming back to that, um, there's one question about stablecoin. When we do valuation, we, do, we did obtain valuations on, on crypto, mostly on projects. As uh, George was saying, for example, we do a discount cash flow and uh, we on uh, SushiSwap and on the, um, Uniswap, we understand the concept. We understand that uh, they generate, you know, fee for the, um, the token holders and, and that could be so like so like dividend of cash flow. And when we do valuations in equity, what we do is just, uh, you know, try to understand the future cash flow discounted to present value today. The only issue is with the fair price of things. When we buy an equity, we do discount cash flow in equity. We imply a certain growth. And we also imply sort of marginal safety. We understand that there is a minimum amount of sustainable earnings that's going to happen anyway, regardless of the growth. And that one is a bit more complicated in crypto for some projects, for example. Now, what would be interesting, and I just put it there, you know, equity researchers now are coming closer to try to understand to value crypto, but they don't really have the background in crypto, but they do have the background in valuation. So that would be great. For example, we in the industry, we have uh, something called CFA, a Certified Financial Analyst Certificate, where people study how to become um, an analyst, how to do, how to use those tools to analyze equity. It would be great if they could be one day, and maybe with some of you guys, because you know a lot about how to value uh, also crypto projects, you know, if there would be a body, you know, like international body like the CFA, also for the, the crypto, that would be great. Uh, I think there would be uh, a professional figure that would be uh, really requested heavily uh, from uh, industry because now a lot of uh, funds and uh, equity funds and ourselves as well, I mean, we, we want to move into invest uh, heavily in, in crypto, but we want to invest wisely, try to understand the value rather than just simply just go for the for the trend. So I think that would be an amazing uh, yeah, and just to add on that, like in crypto, we have found some nuances. So let's say in equity, we have uh, share buybacks and we have dividends, but in crypto, we have staking rewards. And we also see that growth sometimes doesn't have to be linear, it's exponential. So how do you incorporate, for instance, staking rewards or perhaps exponential growth within your model or within your framework when you're trying to evaluate crypto? So, for example, staking rewards is a bit, uh, yeah, I mean, if we just talk about staking rewards in the sense of Cardano, it's just inflation, right? So, I mean, there is a theory, there is a, actually a whole science around that is called token engineering. It's something I'm personally looking really close at the last couple of months. So, you have to approach these kind of things as a system which has let's say the buy pressure and the sell pressure, right? And then you always, so that's what token is, right? So imagine a token like, let's say Cardano, right? The Cardano is just doing inflation at the moment. So you stake your tokens and I'm giving you rewards, right? Everybody thinks, oh, they give me free money. No, they're actually diluting you, right? And by, by asking you to stake, what do they do? They reduce the sell pressure. So they know that the more people this, they stake, the less people will sell, right? So you get, this is a bit of the, the simplistic model, but you need to start from that. You need to, to approach uh, when you analyze that, this kind of model. And there is actually, there are models in Python which are simulating exactly this process, right? So you're starting from this amount from, I don't know, 12 million of tokens and you do some assumptions and then you do a simulation and you reach to these, to these um, conclusions I mentioned. For example, if you assume that your inflation rewards is more than 10%, then you can assume from other projects that around 60% of your uh, circulation will be staked. So 60% of your circulation will be basically removed from selling pressure. Nobody can sell, right? And what happens if nobody sells and you, you basically increase your marketing and the buy pressure is coming, the price goes up, right? On, on the other hand, if you don't have any uh, staking, so if you have your all of your tokens in the market, 
right? And the, you have no incentives to lock them somewhere or not to sell it. Everybody would just sell, right? And there will be no buy pressure. So this is, I mean, I think we should not go deeper in that because it's a huge topic, but it's super interesting and it's going to the direction that Tony just mentioned before. It's a whole science. So basically engineers are doing that. You need to really know Python, like to code these kind of things, create models. This is amazing. I mean, it's really amazing. Very interesting. I mm -hmm. wish maybe in the next time we can go deeper into it. Because, you know, what you're saying is they, because it could be seen somehow as a Ponzi scheme, if you look at it deeply, in the sense that if you don't create real value, it's just mm -hmm. a marketing way to reduce pressure. But at the end of the day, you're diluting the, the, you, you're diluting the, the company. But, mm -hmm. you know, you are stopping the sales pressure, but you're not really creating value. So the real value will be created in the, how good the projects on the ecosystem will be. Uh, but if that, that good things will not happen, you know, uh, that kind of thing is just a strategy to, to basically reduce selling pressure. But at the end of the day, you know, you are creating more coin that therefore you're basically diluting, let's call them the share of the company or the token in this case. Mm -hmm. So it's important to look before that and simply the, the rewards, correct? That's what your message probably... Is. Yeah, exactly. So my point is like, for example, you need to have some principles, right? So for example, for me, I will never buy a pro... Like I will never buy Cardano, right? No matter how good it is or how many peer reviews or researchers, because I've never seen what it can do. I cannot use this thing, right? I never buy a coin that I cannot use it personally. I don't like to just buy something and just leave it there and pray that it just goes up, Right. Um, so that's one thing, but that is just me. So Cardano and similar projects, what they do is, yeah, they just basically try to fundraise for their development by giving this bait, this carrot to the people, lock it so you don't sell it, so I give you more, right? And then on the other side, they invest a lot of money on marketing. So there are like a hundred, like a, actually a lot of projects who have nothing, uh, they just invest all their money in marketing and they try to, basically convince people with staking or other mechanisms not to sell, basically. And that's how the price goes up. And they have nothing. There is no value. I mean, you cannot really, yeah, you cannot analyze them, this kind of project, because they're just a marketing campaign, a roadmap, and some promises, I don't know, and maybe a GitHub repository or something. But I don't like these kind of projects, no matter if, even if Vitalik is behind that, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Just Thank you very much. We learned so much from uh, this. It's really, really interesting. Please, sorry, go ahead. I want to clarify one thing about staking, which is, is valuable. As George said, it's important as a tool for preserving the price of the token. Uh, and that's uh, important to note because these tokens are used as grants from the communities to actually help develop the project and the product. So if they can't protect the value or the value of the price or the price of the token, excuse me, then they won't be able to provide in oftentimes, especially in the early stages with the grant rewards needed for the growth of the product. They won't be able to provide the wages or the bonuses to the developers that are taking a risk to be part of a new project when they could be working for six figure uh, wages in any of the big blue chip DeFi projects or other projects in crypto. So I wouldn't call it a Ponzi scheme by any means, uh, simply because people are buying these projects as a share of the network, a network which is growing. And if it does grow, it's going to make them tremendous value, both for the utility and for the actual token itself. And you also find ways to add governance to it, which is crucial. And we haven't discussed this. Perhaps uh, George or L can uh, respond to that as well, because DAOs and governance are a crucial tool for how the future of finance is going to look like. One comment to that, Xenophon, very good points. Uh, and uh, you gave me a very uh, interesting uh, yeah, point to, to touch upon. So I don't believe that exactly to this point that just because the network will grow, the price of the token will grow as well, right? That's why I mentioned you need always to look at the tokenomics. There are a lot of tokens that do not capture value, right? And you really need to, to go deeper in the technology to understand what capturing value means. I'll give you two examples. One is Rune, the Tor chain, which basically they say whoever provides liquidity on Bitcoin or Ether, they need to provide the same liquidity in Rune. So if you extrapolate this model with the example we discussed before, that means that when the, the, the more people will have to buy Rune, so the price will go up. 
right? And I give you another example, Uniswap. We all love Uniswap. It's an amazing project. Does, I, from the analysis I've done, I cannot see, so this token does not capture value at all, right? The Sushi Swap, for example, gives uh, to the Sushi holders part of the revenue. Uniswap doesn't. So right. at the moment, Uni token, no matter how amazing it is and how high it will go because it's an amazing company and people believe that, it doesn't capture any value. What can you do with a unit token? You can just vote. That's it. And if you are in a company, in a, a project like Yearn, that your, value, your vote is really valuable because you basically uh, dictate or define the strategies, then it's okay. But if you go and look at uni, Uniswap uh, governance, there is basically nothing even to vote. Amazing. Yeah, that was a comment. Amazing. Thank you. I mean, uh, that's why it's very important to understand deeply, you know, uh, what you buy and, uh, you know, what's behind the token and the, the system you hold. Uh, there's one thing, and then I'm going to let uh, also Mehdi uh, go ahead with the questions. And, uh, and this is a question on stable coin. Some of the projects that seems to be extremely effective, like, for example, uh, Terra Luna, is because they use the stable coin, the possibility to stake, uh, you know, the stable coin and things. But as we've seen for Libra, we actually studied deeply, uh, I think, in uh, one of our uh, university as well, a uh, module uh, about the stablecoin, is that uh, one of the reasons why Libra did not take off is because, uh, you know, uh, the use of the stablecoin they wanted to adapt and, you know, all those regulations and uh, uh, how, how scary that can be for central banks. Do you think that projects which has to do or deal with stablecoins can be more easily um, outlaw, uh, you know, by the CAC, by the, you know, by the governments and how would be the effect on, uh, on the ec old ecosystem if they happens and, uh, and what can happen to people which are going to hold the uh, project or, um, or stable coins in projects? Like, what, what, what do you, how do you see that? Well, the first thing to realize is that stable coins admittedly are not the go-to investment medium for people that are looking uh, into crypto. They're a good tool for hedging risk. They're a good tool for uh, um, warehousing of funds. They can be used in some yield generating strategies, but are not like you know, some decentralized finance project that can do a 10x. So they're, they're not an intuitive uh, investment option. Now, in, in essence, what stable coins are, are uh, a, a primitive medium that interoperates traditional economies with the decentralized economy, right? The whole purpose of stable coin is, or initially was to peg it to some, some stable value, uh, most popularly that of a sovereign national currency to, to use it on, on chain actually. And besides regulation, what can have an impact on, on, on the usability of stable coins is the issuance of CBDCs, meaning um, um, digital currencies uh, backed by sovereign nations that are available to the general public. Now, depending on their characteristics and specifications, and if those play well with uh, deployments from the open blockchain space, the role of stable coins might be diminished, right? And, and significantly so. Now, I'm not suggesting that you will be able to, to you know, farm on, on SushiSwap or whatever with, with a digital euro tomorrow morning, but in the long run, there is an argument to be made that much of the utility of stable coins could be, you know, uh, um, something uh, that uh, CBDCs take over. And that is besides regulation. And this is something that not many people consider. So I would look at CBDCs first because developments there are rapid. And uh, now, so, so th this would be my response. I do see a future where this, the, the, the role of stable coins uh, diminishes. I don't think that it will be disruptive to the, to the ecosystem. Um, and it will be both a factor, uh, be, and it will be both because of new regulations uh, uh, as well as uh, CBDCs, and both are uh, very important. Yeah. And one thing to consider is that 
regula regulation will make mo move will make room for CBDCs, right? Yeah, just to shed some light, uh, so just to add some more color to it. So let's say in terms of the Terra project, we have uh, uh, Terra, Terra stablecoin. Basically, it's algorithmic stablecoin and it's basically fixed. Uh, but whatever value proposition uh, a user finds within the ecosystem, Luna will be burned. So, so our point is perhaps that because the demand for that stablecoin is sort of artificial, even though the underlining uh, value proposition is there, but the stablecoin itself is kind of algorithmic. Don't you think in, in that way, a uh, regulator might find that, okay, there is no underlying backing and it's, it, it could be perhaps outlaw on that basis or, or could you perhaps shed some light on that? Because I think one of the criticism of Libra project was that uh, it, it could basically uh, become a global stable coin and it kind of threatens the whole central banking and monetary policy uh, framework of this. And I want to add just something as well. Like, for example, you know, some friends tell me, "Hey, I can just take on, uh, uh, you know, on USDT, like on on on, Luna, on, uh, on a Terra uh, uh, platform, and have uh, twenty percent a year on on stable." I mean, many many people can retire with twenty percent. Hey, obviously, you know, they should understand more about the risk and things. But I mean, would that these not? Uh, how I mean, would that could not that create a problem? Because you know, when we you know, when we assess, we, we've been long on Terra from 0 0.33. Obviously, we sold, you know, most of it much earlier. We, we did not understand it could go so high, you know. But, you know, at a certain point when we saw the risk, we thought, you know, this thing is too much. It's like uh, it can be a, a serious threat to, to um, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to a real coin, like to a real currency. Uh, that, that kind of thinking is a mistake. Shall we also analyze risk on the basis of how, uh, how big the threat could be to to the, the central system, for example, or, or, or that's the wrong way to, to look at that? This is a good question. Uh, first of all, I want to state that, um, I mean, given the volatility in the space and how things are changing, I, I do not consider you know, stable coins as a viable retirement plan. <laughs> uh, that's that's the first thing to say. So. Uh, secondly, I do think that uh, sovereign nations are more threatened by big tech companies because their solutions, because they will leverage their existing networks, which are huge, and their solutions will uh, interoperate with existing front-end solutions uh, that already exist in, in the regular economy. So the first threat is there. I, I do not see, ten, see any immediate Luna Terra, uh, Tether or USDC or some other deployment uh, from the decentralized space can threaten a, a sovereign nation. That being said, depending on the regulations that will be developed to, to mitigate the impact of uh, privately issued global stable coins, some of those might impact decentralized solutions uh, uh, as uh, well. Uh, I do not see a future where uh, governments will, will um, very surgically target a specific decentralized stablecoin, but wider regulation might affect those. Uh, the important thing to consider here is uh, what we call geographical arbitrage, right? So Facebook necessarily has some, some specific geographical presence within some boundaries and can be regulated uh, um, depending on, on in which country it, it is active. Uh, projects from the decentralized space are, are not like that. Uh, they, they are geographically distributed. They are not managed by, by a single entity. And what I would advise anyone uh, developing a stablecoin project is, is to make sure that they cannot control what they have uh, created because they will be, they will be likely uh, kept liable. Um, so yeah, those are my two cents. I wouldn't be very afraid to, you know, uh, 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 that stablecoins will go away t tomorrow. But, uh, and I think that if, uh, if at some point in the future, they are to be regulated. There will be a, a lot of warning shots along the way and opportunities for people to, you know, uh, reassess their, their investment uh, choices. 
So let me jump in here a little bit myself as well. Uh, stable coins are my passion. And really, in many cases, they've been one of, one of my areas of focus for all of 2019. I was writing a thesis on them and then Libra came about. So I had to turn my thesis in two and start again. But I am a huge proponent of stable coins. I believe stable coins are undervalued in crypto assets at the moment because of dogmatic beliefs uh, held against fiat currency as a, as as many of the older members of the community might tell you. However, let's look at the track record. Over the past few years, the way the growth of the industry has come about has been through investments that came in Silicon Valley through stable coins. The market capitalization, meaning the amount of stable coins minted, meaning the amount of dollars in bank accounts for these companies has exploded as fast as the market capitalization of the whole industry. Uh, if you look today at Tether, which is one of the many stable coins that exist, and it's the most famous one, you will see that its volume, the amount of Tether traded per day in dollar amounts is oftentimes way higher than Bitcoin's daily trading volume. You will see that across multiple uh, different criteria that the growth of stable coins and the way that people use them indicates that the market prefers them as both an onboarding and offboarding off platform at the moment and as an end of day uh, benchmarking product for their trading activities. The only way that you can threaten the way that stable coins operate today is if you provide a better alternative, which could be uh, you know, international, uh, easy to use, uh, interoperable CBDC. However, that's not coming soon. That's gonna be coming in, well, five to 10 years. And even when it does, it's probably not going to be what we are hoping for it to be. There is still a long way to go for stable coins. And when they do come about, they're going to compete with fiat-backed stable coins first. That, uh, that means companies which have a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, a fiat currency locked into their bank accounts, the Tethers, the USDCs, the Gemini dollars, the two USDs, and so on and so on, the Paxos standards. Um, however, there are other types of stable coins, the ones that you described as well, algorithmic being one, which I wouldn't say that Terra, uh, Terra's uh, TUSD is one of those. Um, but there are algorithmic ones which are very, very interesting. And when they do come about, which they haven't so far, they've failed. Every time they've been tried, they have failed, these algorithmic stable coins. Um, you, whenever they come, they might be the tool of choice for anyone that actually cares about the future of decentralization and crypto assets. Uh, if they're able to provide the yield or protect the money, therefore be inflation protected somehow, that would be enough for them to be better money, in, in my mind at least, uh, than CBDCs. And then you have uh, crypto asset backed stable coins like uh, the DAIs and the MKRs or the RSRs, RSVs or the Terra USD where they use either mining power in the case of Terra USD uh, or other crypto assets, whether it's a basket of them like Maker, to create loans pretty much, credit of their own, on their own money. So what they do in the situations is, is not that complicated. They create a collateralized debt position where they put $5 worth of, let's say, Ethereum for this scenario, and they spit out one dollar for every five dollars that they let loan in therefore that if you look at this now they have six dollars worth of their money five being locked in this vault one being in a stable coin form now the value of the people the money that is locked here because the crypto assets might be very very flexible uh, and very variable and volatile however as long as they don't reach a point where they are one to one or under then they always should be covered the risk assessments in these uh, algorithmic backed, crypto asset backed stable coins, because they do both. They are able to mint 
new die because of code, which allows them to create credit for themselves. These are not going to go away. There is use for them. They are the basis of decentralized finance at the moment because you always need to peg at a stable value to be able to return interest. So when we are looking at the way that money works, we need to understand that stable coins are the best tool we have currently to create financial contracts in Ethereum, in other smart chains, and so on and so on. So I don't think their value was going to go away. I, I think uh, buying some of the main um, governance tokens for these stable coins is a very good uh, decision. Maker did uh, what, like a, a 10x or something or more, or is more than that. Uh, RSR did something like a 25x. Like these, these companies did go like crazy high. And uh, there are others that failed completely. And of course, I bought the ones that failed, not the ones that succeeded totally besides Maker. Uh, but that happens with uh, everything that you want to do. You want to take a risk and get a high reward. You Well, you're probably not going to succeed in that because that's the point of risk. Uh, but again, I'm a big fan of stable coins. Now, just to conclude this conversation, because now we opened up a topic that I love to talk about. Regulations against stable coins are coming. Like they're here, they're being reviewed currently at the European Parliament. They're called asset reference tokens. Asset reference being anything that has to do with metal, uh, commodities, stocks, or sovereign currency. So the whole of Mika was pretty much created and influenced, uh, at least it seems like it to me, from the desire of these European countries to go against uh, a big incumbent entering their money uh, industry, which would be in this scenario, DM and, and Libra. However, when it comes to the risks that you see in a token like uh, Terra USD, well, at least you see the risk. There are billions of people in the world that don't have the euros like we do, or the dollars that they have in the States, that don't have good sovereign currency that they can trust and they can't see the risk because they're supposed to be riskless money, but that's not the case. Like It's true that you will have hyperinflation in some countries. If you are in Angola or in Turkey or in Venezuela and they provide you an option to have your own fiat currency from your own country or Terra USD, I can tell you that as long as someone is tech savvy, they will probably prefer Terra USD. And sure. I'm a big fan of Libra. Big fan of Libra because billions of people that did not have access to good money will be able to get access to Libra and store their wealth and build their wealth digitally where nobody can actually effectively confiscate that. Although, I mean, that's permission ledger. It, you can always find ways to bully a company to provide you with money from other people. That's always a risk. But the rewards are higher than the risk for many, many people. It's amazing, guys. Thank you very much. I mean, we, um, we're enjoying so much. I'm enjoying so much this conversation. It's really, really interesting. Uh, I want to just, uh, you know, for the, the last part of the, the you know, the, the, the podcast that is left, uh, concentrate on the project uh, that you, you're working on. I mean, I think uh, not many people know, I mean, in our community, not many people know, uh, the most advanced do, of course, but not everybody knows about the DAO, right? So if you could tell us more about what the DAO is and how it's going to affect the or the ecosystem, and what are you in particular working on? And uh, and I saw the project. I've been participating to some codes, and uh, it's uh, it was really really amazing. It's really really interesting. So I really look forward to to your uh, explanation. I want to give the floor to L briefly because I want him to discuss what the DAO is. I know that's his specialty, and then I can grab uh, grab the mic again and discuss what we are trying to build, as well as what the lab is trying to build and how someone can participate in our work. So the floor is yours. I will just give you a very brief overview of what we mean when we say DAO. So DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, decentralized in the sense that it is not a conventional company. It is geographically distributed and it, is, it relies on the blockchain. It is autonomous in the sense that it does not rely 
on you know the the, the laws of the physical world and and of the world, you know, but uh, rather on smart smart contracts that conventionally uh, uh, execute based based on on um, pre-programmed um, um, code and. Um, and it is an organization in the sense that it is a collection of people that come together in order uh, to fulfill a, a common goal. And I'll pass it on to, to Xenophon for, for, to, to explain what our goal is. Absolutely. And for that, I think we need to start from the history. So earlier in the year, the first bubble came for crypto. We were looking at Bitcoin at 15K for a long, long time, and then boom. 30k within two weeks, uh, perhaps a bit more, perhaps a bit less. That kickstarted this cycle we're in, which we expected anyway if you were in the industry. And in that time, I decided to create a community uh, that would be both international in, in, in nature and scope, as well as focus a bit on Greece. Um, we looked at the industry in Greece and we saw tremendous skepticism that was unwarranted for some of the innovations taking place in these smart chains, as I like to call them. And we saw a lot of hostility on a couple of new ideas, at least I did. Um, so I created this community uh, for two reasons. First, because I want to protect my community and my friends from being scammed from bad, bad projects that are prevalent in the Greek ecosystem. The ones that promised the moons and delivered nothing. Um, and we're not talking about Cardano in this case, because Cardano is a serious project, even though we don't perhaps like it as much as others. We're talking about bad, bad projects. I'm not even going to mention them because they're scams that were prevalent in the Greek ecosystem. Uh, that was the first. The second one was to embed this uh, understanding and the value and to build this community of, of novice people entering the space as, alongside my network and the network of my network, which I invited to participate in this community, and we flourished. We did not expect the growth that we saw. However, we soon realized that the knowledge gap between the novice investor that still wants to yield farm but doesn't actually know how to do it, um, and these are, mind you, not 20-somethings. These are oftentimes older gentlemen that have been in the financial industry for quite some time that understand the main ideas behind it, but perhaps might not know how to get these things deployed. Uh, we realized that people were eager to learn and eager to participate in these um, opportunities, but there was very few ways that we could guide them effectively, uh, which is why gradually the discussion of this DAO emerged. And the DAO functions as a community managed pool of funds where you can exit at any time you wish and you can enter at any time you wish. There are some limitations for the earliest versions of how often or how much or how little you can invest, but that's simply so that we can test the waters why we actually built. Um, that will, this DAO that will deliver a couple of key services to our community members, which are cross-chain yield farming services. That means we pull money together, we delegate them to a team of experts, including both the people that are in the call and others which could not make it. We plan along, we have a multi-six so they can protect the money as much as we possibly can, and then we move to deploy them. That's at least what the main concept is. In the near future, we hope that all of this can be done algorithmically without trusted delegation of funds and decision-making with voting and with grants that can actually help build some of the ecosystem in Greece. And as I was saying uh, before and over the chat, the talent in Greece is world-class oftentimes. The people we have in our community are, in my mind, the best that are active within our community in Greece because they know what they're talking about and they are willing to sit back and research thoroughly before making a decision. So that's why these people are selected by the community to lead this initiative. Now, furthermore, besides that, we created multiple other projects that are coming outside of the community. We issued the first NFTs in Greece. We issued the first social token NFTs in Greece. Um, we've already started educating some of our developers in our community in Solidity. 
We closed multiple partnerships, including one with Consensus, where I'm going to become their ambassador in Athens. And that will allow my community and my developers access to their blockchain academy for Solidity, which is crucial because there is not enough talent. Like everyone that's writing Solidity is either wealthy and rich right now or is building something that's going to make them rich. We need to have a real caring system of, of talent development. We also started a partnership, which is almost complete. These things, I'm telling you these now because they are going to be complete in the next few days. This other partnership is with a design and UX UI firm called Pins & Co. They are co-creators of Google Creative Lab, and they are in charge of rebranding the Greek economy and the Greek tourism industry. So they're going to be coming in, helping us with UX, UI, and design and branding. And lastly, we build a partnership with Wasio. Now, Wasio are legal tech experts which are looking to build the first Lao in Europe, and that's going to be Athens DAO. DAO, the Athens DAO is going to be a compliant firm. And next to, comp to the compliant DAO, we will have a development studio, uh, not a development studio, a venture studio, a startup studio that will manage the tech talent and the wages and the calls for building this DAO. This is regular practice across the industry, but we'll also focus on helping the community build its own projects out, projects which can benefit the DAO and its activities and yield farming. So what we are trying to achieve here is build an ecosystem of world-class talent and success. It's going to be a big uh, path to achieve this. However, the talent is there. The desire is there. We have over 20 people volunteering for work. Both George and Elle, who's in the call, volunteer their time to be here. I'm not paying them for this. They want us to make it happen, make it work. We have over seven full stack developers working with me at the same time, learning Solidity while they go along, helping me deploy this DAO contract in a side chain, which is going to diminish the gas needs and will allow more access to our members who are also educating in what it means to access these L2 solutions. Um, and there are multiple other projects, which I'm not gonna get into detail now that are being deployed with parts of our community. So we expect that if things fall along the way as we intend them to fall, if, if blocks are filled, as, as we say, that we may be one of the pillars of the Greek ecosystem when it comes to crypto. That's the goal. The goal is to bring Greece and Athens to the level that we should be. And we are lacking compared to our neighbors, including Italy and Turkey. Turkey is number five globally for crypto asset adoption. They have a very similar culture to us, although we don't like to talk about that that much. So that's the summary. That's what we're trying to achieve. If you are looking at equity investors and venture capitalists that are trying to enter the space, they would have a tremendous opportunity to do so through the lab, which will be a compliant legal entity based in Luxembourg, most likely. It's being built right now. That they will be able to have both discounted rates for um, offerings of our project tokens when they enter the market. And they will also have equity protection. And they would have a term, like an actual vote in a board because they are equity shareholders of a legitimate business that exists already. We are not reinventing the wheel. We're trying to merge the two. And we know we can do that because we work with policy and we know what's coming. So that's that. Thank you. Uh, one question, two questions about, uh, and to, to, to finalize. Uh, if there is anybody that uh, has, um, would like to learn, cooperate, um, become uh, you know, part of your community from two sides. One side is people that maybe they're very young. We have some people that are really young and maybe they don't have much money, but they would love to learn or eventually find a job, or eventually find an opportunity to, to, um, to interact with your community, uh, to learn eventually to participate after they learn, of course. How would they do that? And for the other side, if these investors that want to, want to uh, support your projects, uh, you know, and with sticking money into it, you know, putting uh, uh, financial resources that uh, could be helpful for your community at the beginning, how would they do that? So these two kind of those two kind of figures in our community, how would they be able to participate to your ecosystem? Absolutely, great questions. For people that are trying to enter the space and learn, 
currently we we won't be able to help them at the moment but by the time that this podcast becomes public that probably will be changed right now because we are building multiple projects we have a vetted uh, curated community which is private and we're keeping it so because we discuss uh, sensitive information about what, what we're trying to build uh, and we want to make sure that the ones that we have there which is nearly 100 people are all high quality active members of our community which is what they are um, however we haven't skipped from what we started we still want to help novice investors and novice participants of the community learn the basics of what the market is and also learn how to guide themselves through it and perhaps even learn to code because we want to provide these services too. We expect that by the time we uh, get this project up and running, we will open up the community publicly at that point. We will continue to grow it. We'll continue to grow it in universities as well in Greece because it's important that we help uh, get people in now that they're learning and growing. Uh, so we definitely plan to open the community up and we want to be good at what we do first so that we can show that we are builders. We're not just talkers, which is a big part of what happens with communities. Um, so that's the first answer. The second answer, when it comes to investors that are potentially interested, they can reach out to me over LinkedIn, xenophon.contouris, that is X-E-N-O-F-O-N. That's my first name. Last name is K-O-N-T-O-U-R-I-S. Or they can reach me on Telegram simply at Xenophon, which is X-E-N-O-F-O-N. Uh, there's very few of us. So don't forget. Thank you. We're going to put all these uh, in our uh, in the in the link, uh, you know, below the, the podcast. And we're going to, of course, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, put them on the Discord and our uh, our uh, Telegram so that you can be reached. Uh, you know, I think uh, if uh, Mehdi does not have any other questions, uh, I don't know, we really um, coming to the end. So is there anything else that you guys want to add? Uh, um, you know, anything that you are really, it was amazing. I mean, for me, I just want to thank you for your ability. I really appreciate your, you know, you guys are amazing brain, you know, and, uh, and anytime you guys, uh, you know, um, have a, a, a topic or uh, something to, to say, we learn so much from it that it's really, really, really appreciate your uh, your, your support and your, uh, you know, all your um, uh, information. So uh, I want to thank you. And if there's anything else that you had, I think we can uh, probably analyze it uh, here. So uh, there, There's a few things that I'm going to say. Uh, first thing about the CPA for crypto, uh, there are companies building analysts for DeFi, and that will be the analyst of the future. So you asked about this at some point. Consensus is building this service and they're building teams to, achieve, to, to provide these consulting services. I'm sure others are doing the same. We believe that the analyst of, of the future needs to learn code and at least to read it and also needs to, to learn tokenomics. And we have some of the best token experts and token engineers in the world within our community. Lisa Tan specifically of token engineering is part of it. Uh, we have a few others. Some of the biggest people in, in DAOs in Europe and in the world are also active. That's the whole point of keeping it curated and private at the moment. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is you kind of asked us in the past to provide you with what's in our portfolio right now. So I'm going to go around the table and I'm going to ask both my colleagues for one recommendation for one project. And I kind of have these from you from the past. So I'm happy to jump in and provide influence, uh, influence on that if you want to. But uh, my project to watch is Sovereign. I'm going to go with Sovereign, which is DeFi for Bitcoin. George. I'm going to go with Rune. And L. Um, I, I'm not sure if I feel comfortable. Just, just sell at the top. This is my advice. Great advice as always. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. I yeah, appreciate it. Uh, th th thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.